We've had two events in the last three years, which I believe signal the end game for the great industrial revolutions based on fossil fuels. The first event, July 2008, you remember that month? Oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets. And the entire global economy shut down. What I want to suggest to you is that was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock related. We're still dealing with the aftershock. We haven't gotten to the earthquake. What happened that propelled the entire economy to shut down in July 2008? The reason is this entire global economy is made out of, moved by, fossil fuels. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. Virtually all of our construction materials, from plastic to cement, they're made out of fossil fuels. Almost all of our pharmaceutical products are still petrochemical based. Our synthetic fiber is, our power, our transport, our heat, our light. We built a great short-lived civilization in the 19th and 20th century based on digging up the carbon deposits of a previous period in history. So when oil went over 80 a barrel in 2007, all the other prices went up across the supply chain. They're all made out of and moved by fossil fuels. When oil hit $120 a barrel, we had food riots, as you know, in 22 countries. Because the basic price for wheat, barley, rye, rice were doubling and trebling because of the oil price. And the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization said, we have a billion people in harm's way. A dramatic crisis. At $147 a barrel, the prices for everything we buy in this world became so expensive that everybody stopped buying and the entire economy collapsed. Why is this happening? Because we've reached two milestones. Peak oil per capita and now global peak oil production. Peak oil per capita occurred way back in 1979 at the height of the curve for the Second Industrial Revolution. Had we distributed all the crude oil that we had in 1979 to everyone living on the planet at that moment in time, that's the most each person could have, if we shared it. We found more crude oil since then, but population rose quicker. So if we distributed all the crude oil we have now, to seven billion people, there's just less to go around. The second milestone, global peak oil production, 2006. Global peak oil production is a controversial idea until recently. It's when half the crude oil is used up on the classic Hubert Bell curve in geology. When half the oil is used up, it's over. We cannot afford the prices after that. This idea of global peak oil production, the optimist said, well, we've got a few more decades. The pessimist said, no, it looks like our models show we're already getting there. The International Energy Agency dropped the bombshell last December. We were asleep. The IEA, which is our authoritative body on these questions, said, it now looks like we peaked in crude oil production at 70 million barrels a day in 2006, five years ago. And we're likely going to plateau down to 69 million barrels of crude oil a day, but listen to this. It's going to cost us $7 trillion to get the remaining oil out in the next 20 years, according to the IEA. We now know the outer limits of how far we can globalize this world based on the existing industrial paradigm. It's about 150 a barrel. This is an end game. What I want to suggest to you this morning, here at UNIDO, every time we try to regrow this global economy, at the same rate we were growing before July 2008, all prices go up, all the other prices go up, purchasing power goes down, and we collapse. The reason is this. 
when China and India and the emerging nations brought a third of the human race into the game in the last 10 years, which is their right to be engaged, the aggregate demand against the supply of oil was so great, 147 is the wall. So what I want to suggest to you is this is just what's happening this morning. In 2009, oil went down to 30 a barrel because there was no economic activity. It stopped. As soon as we tried to restart the engine and replenish inventories, oil went up to 100 a barrel. It's 115 this morning. All the other prices are going up. Purchasing power is plummeting. We're heading to a second collapse. And simply read the Financial Times today, page 6. It's all there. We're in denial. We're going to see four-year cycles of regrowth, start the engine, collapse. Regrowth, start the engine, collapse. This is going to go on for 20 years. There's no way to get through this wall. We can go to dirtier fuels, tar sands in Canada, heavy oil in Venezuela, coal, shale gas, but they're even dirtier, and they emit more CO2, which gets us to the second event of the last three years. Copenhagen. 192 countries come together to address the entropy bill for the first and second industrial revolution. I'm sure we have some engineers here today. Any engineers? You know you cannot escape that second law of thermodynamics. This is not a metaphor. We have spent huge amounts of carbon to move the first and second industrial revolution. Now we have so much CO2 spent entropy in the atmosphere and industrial induced methane and nitrous oxide we just can't get enough of the sun's heat back off this planet it's as simple and complex as that how bad is it of course you remember the united nations panel on climate change issued its fourth assessment report 2007 and this is several years ago now but they're saying maybe a three degree celsius rise in temperature on earth in this century. That's now looking optimistic five years later. But to give you parents here and grandparents a perspective, if we only go up three degrees in this century, that takes us back to the temperature on Earth three million years ago in the Pliocene. Completely different ecosystems, different dynamics. And climate change is all about the radical shift in the water cycle. I notice your needles bringing together water, fuel, food. They all go together. Water, food, and energy. For every one degree that the temperature rises on this planet from industrial-based carbon dioxide emissions, the atmosphere absorbs 7% more precipitation from the ground. It just sucks up that precipitation into the atmosphere. That radically disrupts the entire water cycle of the watery planet. More floods, more droughts, more wildfires, more hurricanes, more tsunamis, more ice melts, more extreme winter and summer conditions. Our ecosystems can't catch up to a radical shift in the water cycle in a few decades. So our scientists in the UN panel now estimate that we are in the early stages of the sixth great extinction event of life in world history over the 500 million years in the geological record. We've had five extinction waves in 500 million years. Every time there was a mass extinction of life, and it comes quick, because of chemistry, the planet shifts fast. Each time it took 10 million years to recover the biodiversity we lost. And now our scientists say we are in the early stages of the sixth great extinction event right now. And on the upper end, parents, on the upper end, they're projecting perhaps a 70% wipeout of all species of life on this earth by the end of the century. As my wife says, we are sleepwalking. We are in denial. So, peak globalization, 147 a barrel. Every time we try to regrow the economy at the same rate we're growing, it's going to collapse. Now we have real-time climate change impacting agriculture and food yields, and now impacting infrastructure with extreme weather. So what do we do? 
We need a new economic vision for the world. It has to be compelling and practical. We need a new economic game plan for that vision that's deliverable in less than 30 years. The vision and game plan has to move as quickly or even more quickly in the developing countries than the developed countries. We have to be off carbon by 2040. We've got a slim shot to get through this door, but it can be done. It requires complete focus. So we need to ask the first question. How do the great economic revolutions in history occur? As we know how those economic revolutions occur, we can get a little bit of a road map on where UNIDO and the UN and the world community needs to go. The great economic revolutions in history occur when two things come together. First, we change the way we organize energy. We've had a lot of different energy regimes through history. New energy regimes make possible more complex civilizations. They allow us to annihilate time and space with the increased energy, bring more people together, differentiate skills, integrate people into larger economic and social units. But when new energy regimes emerge, they have to be accompanied by new communication revolutions that are agile enough to manage them. It's when communication and energy revolutions merge, when they come together, those are the great pivotal points in history. They change the economic paradigm. They change consciousness. They change our gestalt, as German philosophers would say. For example, 19th century, first industrial revolution. Print technology becomes cheap in the early 19th century because we introduced steam power into printing, linotype and rotary presses. So we can mass produce printing really cheap, low transaction costs. Then we introduced public schools in Europe and America, and we created a print literate workforce with the communication skills to manage the complexities of coal power, steam driven first industrial revolution. Could never have managed it with an illiterate workforce. Another convergence of communication energy, second industrial revolution, 20th century. Centralized electricity, and really especially the telephone and then later radio and television became the communication media to manage and market a more dispersed auto, oil, and suburban culture and a mass consumer society. Clearly, this second industrial revolution is dying this morning. Fossil fuels, uranium, these energies are sunsetting. The prices are never going down again. The technologies based on these energies like the internal combustion engine, are exhausted. The whole infrastructure of this global economy is made out of fossil fuels and it's crumbling. I'll share an anecdote with you. When Chancellor Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she invited me in the first few weeks of her administration to Berlin to address the question, how do we grow the German economy in the 21st century and create jobs? Because as the Director General said, it's all about jobs, growth, sustainability. It's a package. Now, remember, Germany is the most robust industrial nation per capita by far in the world. And advised with China as the leading exporting power, even though there's only 80 million people there. When I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the Chancellor is, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy or the European or global economy in the last stages of a great energy era? On the downside of the curve. That's what we're all facing, and no one can escape from that curve. We are on the cusp of a third industrial revolution this morning, a new convergence of communication and energy that's going to give us a powerful economic paradigm shift and produce hundreds of millions of jobs and thousands of new businesses, if we can get there in time, if we can focus. We had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 20 years, the Internet. Now, what's interesting about the Internet is it's so different than the centralized communication electricity I grew up on in the 20th century, top-down, one-to-many communications. The Internet is bizarre because the communication is distributed, it's collaborative, and it scales to lateral power. 
So today, and this is amazing to me, we did this in 20 years. Today, this morning, 2.3 billion people can take a little cell phone or a little desktop computer in the palm of their hand and send their own video, audio, and text to all the other 2 billion people at the same time. Lateral power. With far more lateral power than all the centralized television networks of the 20th century. This internet technology revolution, this communication vehicle, is now just beginning to merge in the last 24 months in Europe and especially Germany, which I explained is leading this whole revolution. This internet revolution is beginning to merge with a new energy regime. Distributed internet communications to organize distributed forms of energy. What are distributed forms of energy? Let me contrast them to elite forms of energy, which you and I are familiar with. Coal, oil, gas, uranium, shale gas, heavy oil, tar sands, that's elite energy. Because chances are when you go home, those energies aren't in your backyard. They're only found in a few places. They require huge military investments to secure them. Massive geopolitical management to control them and huge finance capital to organize them from the wellhead to you and me. Be clear, fossil fuels and nuclear power are the most centralized, elite, top-down energies we've ever conceived of in history. And they require everything else to scale that way. Centralized factories, centralized logistics, centralized production, centralized value chain. And you end up at the end of the line with the 1% versus the 99%. Let me be honest here. We are talking about the young people earlier, the Director General. At the end of the second industrial revolution with these top-down energies, the top three out of the top four companies are energy companies. Underneath them, a lot of big banks, 500 companies that we account for one-third of the GDP of the world. That's just the way it is. I understand it. I teach in the oldest business school in the world, the Wharton School. I teach CEOs for a long, long time. But that's the way it's organized at this point. What are distributed energies? Those are energies found in your backyard. The sun shines all over the world every single day. The wind blows across this beautiful planet every single day. Underneath the ground, there's a hot geothermal core of heat ready to be turned into energy every day. If we live in the rural areas, we have an abundance of forestry and agricultural waste that can be culled back to energy at a moment's notice. If we live on the coastal areas, our urban populations, those ocean waves and tides, they're coming in and out every day for energy. Wherever we have garbage, we can bioconvert it overnight back to energy. We have enough distributed energy in every square inch of this planet to provide for our little species until kingdom comes. The European Union has committed itself to a five-pillar infrastructure, a nervous system, for a great third industrial revolution. I was privileged to help develop the plan. It was endorsed by the European Parliament officially in 2007. It's working its way through the Commission, the agencies, and the member states. And all these five pillars I'm lining up now, Germany is leading by far. They're on point, on target, on mission the German economy, to move us into this third industrial revolution. Pillar one, the EU is committed to 20% renewable energy by 2020. That's a mandate, not a suggestion. That means a third of the electricity of Europe has to be green. Pillar two, how do we collect distributed energies? Now, interesting enough, our first thought was, well, that's, that's, that's easy. Let's go to Spain, Greece, and Italy. They got a lot of sun. We'll put in some concentrated solar parks, a high voltage line, and we'll ship it out to the rest of Europe and beyond. The Irish have the wind. The Norwegians have the hydro. Concentrate it, ship it. Now, let me say, none of us oppose more concentrated uses of what are essentially distributed energies. Geothermal, hydro, solar, wind. They're essential, but not sufficient. They're transitional. And we cannot create the kind of jobs and business opportunities the Director General mentioned just on concentrated uses of distributed energies. They're part of the mix. We began to ask a question in Brussels that now seems remarkably naive. 
If renewable energies are distributed and found in every square inch of this planet, why in heaven's name are we only concentrating them in a few central points? That's 20th century thinking based on top-down approaches to energy. Pillar two, buildings, buildings, buildings. The number one use of energy on this planet is our buildings, our infrastructure. Parenthetically, I always mention this, the number two cause of climate change after buildings is beef production and consumption and related animal husbandry. And I mention this because, Mr. Director General, not one government leader in 192 countries has, seen, has made a single statement yet on the number two cause of climate change, which makes me wonder how serious we are about our own extinction. Number three is transport. Number one, buildings. We have 191 million buildings in the EU. Homes, offices, factories. The goal is to convert every single existing building in the European Union to your own green micro power plant. 190 million power plants. So you can collect sun off the roof for electricity, wind off the side of your building for electricity, geothermal heat under your building for electricity, garbage we converted back to green electricity, the works. The new buildings already up in Europe this year are positive power. Bui Construction in Paris has a beautiful off office building next to the OECD, just came up. It collects enough sun alone that it provides for the entire office complex and can send back to the grid. Pillar two jump starts the European and world economy. It's going to require millions and millions and millions of labor hours and jobs and thousands of small and medium en enterprises to do it to convert the entire infrastructure, the whole building stock of Europe and then hopefully Africa, Asia, the Americas. That's 40 years of local production, huge multiplier effect. Germany's leading in pillar two. They're converting thousands of buildings already all across Germany and they don't have a lot of sun. Pillar three. We have to store this distributed green energy because, unfortunately, the sun isn't always shining. And, you know, sometimes the wind's blowing at night, but as you know, you need the electricity during the day. It's not cooperating. Water tables can be down when there's climate drought. So we have to store these intermittent energies. I'm in favor of all storage technologies. I'm sure in your countries you're working on batteries and flywheels and capacitors and water pumping. Put them all in to store. But at the EU level, we place most of our emphasis at the center of the storage network on hydrogen. Because it's the basic element of the universe. It's what we're made of. It stores other energies. It's modular. You can put it in a little house or a huge utility company. So when the sun hits your roof in your house or your building office, you generate some green electricity. If you have some surplus you're not using, you simply put that surplus green electricity in, a, in water. The hydrogen comes bubbling out into a tank. Remember high school chemistry? Some of you slept through this. Goes into the tank. And then when you need that green electricity, you just convert that hydrogen back to electricity. A small thermodynamic loss compared to bringing fossil fuels and nuclear power from the beginning to the end of the line. The EU has committed 7 billion euros to a public-private investment to put hydrogen storage into every building, and Germany again is leading. Pillar four is for the young people that the Director General mentioned. This is the one they love. This is where the internet communication revolution merges with the new energies to create a powerful third industrial revolution nervous system. We take off the shelf internet technology. We convert the electricity and power lines of Europe, Africa, Asia, the Americas into an energy internet in the next 20 years. That acts exactly like the internet. So when millions of buildings are collecting green energy on site, storing it in hydrogen like we store in media and digital, and then if you don't need some of that electricity and someone else does a thousand miles away, your software could program that green electricity across an energy internet from ocean edge to ocean edge. Germany is testing the smart grid, the energy internet right now in six major regions of Germany. Pillar five, Electric plug-in transport came in this year. Hydrogen fuel cell cars, buses, and trucks are coming in in 2014. Daimler, GM, Toyota, all the companies. 
you'll be able to connect up your vehicles anywhere in the infrastructure and get green electricity from the buildings. Wherever you travel, you and I can stop, plug back into the grid, thousands of power charging units, every street. And you can either get green electricity from the grid, or if the price is right, let's say you're at the office working and your car's sitting out there, the program on your software can say, time to sell my electricity back to the grid, I'm going to make money. These five pillars together are a new technology revolution. Independently, they're just components. It's when you bring them together, renewable energy, convert the buildings to power plants, store that energy in the form of hydrogen, create an energy internet to share it across continents and plug in your transport, put them together, it's a nervous system for hundreds of millions of jobs because we have to convert the entire global economy. The entire infrastructure has to be converted and you get jobs day one. Every country in here is day one. The minute you start moving this node and creating this node in each city and region, jobs and businesses. It doesn't start at the end of the line. This is power to the people. This is the democratization of energy. This moves us to the vision of the Director General, which is universal access to electricity and energy. And that's the name of the game. The reason people are powerless in the world today is literal and figurative. People are powerless because they don't have power. 40% of the human race lives on $2 a day or less. 20% of the human race, as the Director General says, has no electricity. Another 20% has only marginal, frequent electricity. Show me a country where there's no electricity and I'll show you the most marginalized populations in the world that are not able to move to an industrial model. It's as simple as that. And I'll also show you countries where half the human race is really bad off the women and the children because they're the beasts of burdens. They have to carry that energy load manually. So, this is distributed capitalism. It requires everyone being an entrepreneur. But it also requires all of us collaborating in deep social networks so we can share our energy and create solidarity across entire continents. The music companies, I watched this happening, they did not understand file sharing of music. When millions of kids started file sharing music with new software, the music companies thought it was a joke. Then they went out of business. The newspapers did not understand the distributed, collaborative nature of the blogosphere. Millions of people sharing knowledge, information, together, democratically, collaboratively. Now the newspapers are going out of business or creating blogs. As powerful as this first part of this revolution is, the communication side, the democratization of information, it's only half the story. You know, Steve Jobs, he didn't live to see his real legacy. Steve Jobs and those early entrepreneurs, they gave us the personal computer and the internet. That allowed us to democratize information. But the real legacy is when that internet revolution merges with energy, and hundreds of millions of people can produce their own green energy and electricity and share with each other. And if we did the first part in 20 years, the democratization of information, tell me why we can't do the second part in 20 years. The first industrial revolution scales vertically, top-down, and favors national markets and national states. You can't do much more on a pyramid. That's as far as you can go. The third industrial revolution likes to run. It likes to run uninhibited across borders and across land masses till it reaches the ocean edge. The shift from a second to a third industrial revolution is going to shift us to continental markets and continental political unions. This bottom-bottom approach to globalization, because it's not centralized and distributed, means everybody's engaged on the same playing field. It means SMEs can form networks where millions come together and pool their risks. The next stage of globalization is continentalization, and it'll lead to a much more equitable distribution of the fruits of society, because everyone's engaged. And it favors continental political unions as networks that can help all the governments within those networks regulate, if you will, the commerce and trade. And the idea in each continent is to create a third industrial revolution infrastructure which everyone shares, because everyone's a player. So no one dominates. This is lateral power. Then a seamless electricity grid, 
that's green, a seamless communication and transport grid that's green across entire continents, so that you engage in commerce and trade on an even playing field where everyone benefits. Because that green energy is all produced local, but you have to share it in order to maintain a continental economy. The European Union's here, the Asian Union's forming quickly, the African Union's here, the South American Union just formed two years ago, and that's the next stage if we can get there. If we can get there. Last thoughts on this. I don't think any of this is easy. And I wouldn't want to bet on whether we can pull this off. But what is plan B? As my wife said, this isn't rocket science. We know we have to get off fossil fuels for all the reasons we know. That means we have to go to renewables. We know that. Pillar two, we know we have to collect them, and the way to collect them is our infrastructure. Suck up all those green energies around our infrastructure, the buildings. Pillar three, we have to store them, or it's not reliable, so we're going to have to put in hydrogen and other storage. Pillar four, we're going to have to share those energies because the Yurtra is creating a little energy and I'm creating a little. We have to share with each other to create enough load to manage a global economy. That's an energy internet. And pillar five, we've got to plug them in, plug them into green transport so we can have mobility. If there's another plan, I just don't know what it is. But getting there is going to be difficult. And what UNIDO has set out is a real challenge to the world. Because UNIDO is saying now it's time to address all the issues that we face in this world by creating a new economic paradigm, a new industrial paradigm that can move as quickly in the developing world as the developed world, that can create a more just society, a more equitable distribution of the fruits, and address the overwhelming issue of climate change at the same time. But be clear, the third industrial revolution is not a climate plan. It's not an energy plan. It's an economic industrial plan that I believe moves much quicker to address those other issues we have to address because it's motivated by the market. Last thoughts. I want to talk about the young kids that the Director General mentioned. I had an opportunity to visit a lot of these young people in the October 15th movement, the Occupy Wall Street, especially the young kids in Spain and Italy, where the biggest demonstrations were. These young people, they think differently than, than the old generation. I never heard the word right, left, capitalism, socialism. They don't think that way. That's 20th century ideology based on the top-down economic, energy, and communication regime we have. When these young people think about politics, their political spectrum is quite different. It's not right-left. They ask the question, does this institutional behavior, whether it's political, business, civil society, is this institutional behavior centralized, top-down, proprietary, and closed? Or is this institutional behavior distributed, collaborative, open, transparent? This is a generation of lateral power. For an old guy like me, and I may be the oldest person in this room, I'm a war baby, I grew up to think power is always pyramidical, top down. I would think of lateral power as an oxymoron, but these kids are organizing. And they've shown logistically they can come to the streets around the world. But now the real test is whether this young generation can join with the older generation and refashion the communication energy matrix move us to a third industrial revolution infrastructure in time to provide millions and millions and millions of jobs and thousands of new business opportunities for the kids. And let me say, they're ready for this. These young people grew up on the internet. They're empowered with the idea of sharing information democratically with each other across vast social networks. For them, the idea of now using that technology to share green energy in every developing and developed country collaboratively across geographic spaces this is their time. But what that generation is going to have to do is meet with the older generation and the apparatuses that we have on this planet and together roll up our sleeves, focus our attention, create a more just society, both in the developing and developed world. If we can do this, we may be able to survive this next period of history. We may be able to lower the temperature on the planet, preserve our species, steward our fellow creatures. And I'll remind you to take home this idea. 99.5% of all the species that have ever existed on this planet have gone extinct over time. 
There's no fail-safe that our little species will be the only one to survive. We need to get smart. We need to steward our relationship with our fellow creatures. We need to move from geopolitics to biosphere consciousness. And it's an organization like UNIGO, which you're also dedicated to, that can be the engine, the vehicle, if you will, not only to move this vision, but to move this game plan. And if the folks in this room from countries around the world can help direct us in this new way, the legacy we will leave, a planet that's rejuvenated, a younger generation that ho has hope for the future, and a more just society for all of us. Thank you.